this is kind of some motivation for me. I know it sounds weird, but you know, people are talking, Nico will be gone, bye bye Nico, whatever. For me, it's just do what you got to do. Play well. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst over at Basketball Monster and you can find me as always on Twitter at RedRock underscore Beeble, a couple of other Twitter accounts that you should pay attention to, the Locked On NBA Network account, which is at Locked On NBA Net, so you can find out when the latest episode of your favorite team's podcast is released. And of course, the Basketball Monster Twitter account, where we retweet all the important information throughout the day, any information from all the NBA's beat writers. You can find that at Bask Monster. Go and check out both of those accounts and follow them. If you don't already, we are going to be covering a jam-packed Martin Luther King Day NBA slate today. The uh, the games from Monday. Now, just a full disclosure, this uh, podcast is being recorded a little bit earlier. I'm heading off to the cricket tonight, taking Ben out to, uh, to watch the Melbourne Stars. Maybe they can actually get a win. For those of you in Australia who know what I'm talking about, so going to see the Stars tonight. So I'm recording a little bit early. We're about halfway through the Rockets-Clippers games. All other, all the other 10 games have been completed. If anything major happens in that Rockets-Clippers game, of course, I will tweet out the information that's necessary there. I'm also going to preview the four games that we've got uh, coming up for Tuesday. We're going to shine the player spotlight uh, to a big man up north. And I'm going to answer one of your questions. Today's question is about food. So... Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. We will start with the monstrous line of the night. And it goes to Kevin Durant of the Golden State Warriors. 32, 5, and 8 for Durant. Four triples, three steals, one block. A perfect 10 of 10 from the line and 9 of 16 from the field for KD. He's the third-ranked player overall this season. He was the third-ranked player overall last season. He is as consistent as they come. You could have got him legitimately. He was sliding to 6, 7, 8 in some drafts that I saw, which was absolute craziness. People going, oh, yeah, he's going to take a step back this year. When he, you know, he was still the third-ranked player last season when he played for the Warriors. So that sort of thinking was a little bit crazy to me. He's still putting up you know, 26 points per game, up to 30 over the last two weeks, some of that without Steph Curry. But he has upped his scoring from last season. He's at back. His three-point shooting is back to an Oklahoma City level. He was only at 1.93s last season, where he'd been at 2.4 to 2.6 for the previous three seasons with OKC. He is back at 2.6 this season. He's blocking over two shots per game, which is obviously helping his value. And his true shooting is immense as usual, at 63%. And there's actually a little bit of scope to improve there because he was a 65% true shooting guy last season. So he does have some room to improve there with his overall field goal percentage and his two-point percentage uh, lower than what it was last season. So he is just rolling along as the uh, the Warriors uh, disposed of the Cavs after the game was close. The Cavs had the early lead. And then the Warriors said, nah, like we're, we're done with this. So let's, uh, let's finish it off. And that's exactly what they did. And KD gets your monstrous line of the night. The waiver wire line of the night goes to a Los Angeles Lakers big man, and that is Larry Nance Jr., who had a double-double, 15 and 11 for Nancy. He had three steals. He had three blocks and was six of nine from the field. This is Nance's second big game in the last three outings. That's his second double-double in that time as well. And if you look back over his past four games, he's been impressive. 13 and 8 with a steal and a block. 10 and 8 with a steal in only 19 minutes. 14 and 10 with two steals and a block. There was that 2 and 7 game against the Mavericks where he suffered that cut on the eye um, in, in 20 minutes. And he played 26 minutes in today's game and uh, and had 15 and 11 with the three steals, three blocks. And he did have to leave this game with a hip issue. So we are seeing some bigger performances from Nance of late. And his value, he, he's a guy that you look at and he's averaging 8.8 .8 points per game, Josh. Like, what sort of value is that? But he's 115th ranked player this season because of the steals, because of his blocks, because of his high field goal percentage, because of his decent rebounds. And over the last couple of weeks, his numbers have been you know, really improved in that area. He is absolutely fine in all 14 team leagues he needs to be owned, and he's absolutely fine to own in 12 team leagues. And if he continues to play the way he's playing at the moment, then he's got, got a shot to be a 10 team league guy as a top 100 sort of a player. There's always going to be some concern, I guess, 
with the way they run that rotation with Julius Randle and the future MVP Kyle Kuzma. But one thing we've seen is that Brookie Lopez is not getting more than 22 minutes. It's just not going to happen. So it's Randle, it's Kuzma, it's Nance there. Randle played fewer minutes in this game with Nance getting a, a bigger load, but he could also see himself go down to 21 or 22 in the next game if Randle gets it rolling or Kuzma getting reduced. So you could see all three of those guys owned in standard leagues, and it wouldn't be an incorrect decision as to which one of those guys should be on your team. I guess it depends on you know, what strengths you're looking for. Most likely, Randall and Kuzma are already owned. So if Nance is out there and you need some defensive numbers with field goal percentage, then he can be a guy that can absolutely help you. But, of course, we know his scoring is going to be a detriment, and I don't imagine that changes anytime soon. The young gun of the night, yes, my boy Frankie Nilakina of the New York Knicks. 10, 7, and 10 for Frank. Two threes, one steal, two blocks. He was three of six from the field and two of two from the line. I think it was maybe yesterday's podcast or the day before. I said, I'm giving up. I've given up trying to understand what Jeff Hornacek does with his rotations. Every time Frank pushes up and plays 28 to 29 minutes for a few games, I think, yep, it's happening. He's going to get the starting job in a few weeks. He's going to consistently play this 28 minute role. Then he goes back for whatever bullshit reason and plays him 18 minutes per night. So I'm not getting too excited by this big game from Frank. 29 minutes. His previous three games hadn't gotten to 20 minutes. So that's the concern. But we see what he can do here. Frank has been very good in a lot of games at getting assists, at getting steals, added blocks in in this game. He's got a really above average defense already for an NBA point guard, let alone a rookie point guard, like just an actual NBA point guard. He is probably in the top five to 10 of point guards in terms of defense at this stage in his career already. The fact that he's dishing assists, he's hitting threes, at an okay level, it's not spectacular, but he's doing all right. 33% over the season, and over the last eight games, he's shooting 39%, which was sort of the number that he put up at the uh, that FIBA uh, under-19s or under-18s tournament last year. I think he shot 42% through that tournament from three, so he's got that ability to do it. His numbers, they're not sexy. 5.6 points, 2.4 rebounds, 3.5 assists, and 1.1 steals, and he's the 238th-ranked player this year. If we knew he'd play 29 to 30 a night, then yeah, he'd be a 12-team league guy. But we've seen this story so many times of uh, of Nilakina play these minutes, look good, and then go back and play 17 minutes so we can get 34 minutes out of Jarrett Jack and rugged Ronnie Baker can play 20 minutes. Like There's just no rhyme nor reason to anything that Hornacek is doing. It could stick. I wouldn't say that he's absolutely a guy to rush out and grab because I don't think he's got this top 60 or top 70 upside for this season. But it's a player to watch, and it's good to see him continually doing this and fighting back through the uh, the rotational dickery that we're seeing from Hornacek with uh, with Nilakina this season. The dud of the night. I tell a man's not hot. Yep, Brook Lopez, five points, one rebound, three assists, two of seven from the field and one of three from the free throw line. He's outside the top 200 over the last month. Brook playing only 18 minutes a game, nine points, two and a half rebounds, still hitting two triples. So at this point, all he is... He is Davis Bertans. He's a three-point streaming option in the power forward or center position as it is for Lopez. I don't think there's any need to own him in 10-team leagues, and I don't think you should own him in 12-team leagues at this point. I would much rather use his position from, for streaming. Now, people look at this and go, what's going on with Lopez? And, and it's it's frustrating, I know. But I understand what Walton's doing, you know, developing these younger guys when Lopez isn't going to be any part of the future for this team. And that, that's totally understandable. I entered this season thinking Lopez was going to be the Lakers' best player. And look, he probably still is, but there's no necessity for them to do that and to see what they can get from these other guys. It's totally it's totally fine. Now, can Brook rehabilitate himself somewhere next season? Yeah, but I don't think he's going to be a 30-minute per game guy next season, uh, no matter where he goes free agency-wise. The other pe- people question people ask is, you know, he, he's definitely going to get traded, trade deadline. You have to remember that part of the reason why Lopez is here in uh, in LA is the fact that he is a $23 million expiring contract. And that $23 million of cap space that gets opened up for next season, that's what the Lakers want to use to bring in Paul George or to bring in LeBron or to bring in DeMarcus Cousins or to bring in two of those three guys. So if they trade him away, they don't want to bring back any sort of salary that extends past this season. And they're also going to need to match the salaries most likely depending on their trade partner, which again, to match $23 million of salary is not an easy thing to do and they have to be all expiring deals. So to me, unless that trade is involving Paul George, which again, I don't think is going to happen, the Lakers hold him because his value to them as an expiring contract is much greater than anything they will get back as a trade return. So I don't see much happening with him moving forward or his value jumping up and, and going through the roof because he goes to another team that's so desperate for a guy like Brook Lopez. 
there's not many of those teams out there that really are desperate for centers and the situation in LA is he he definitely holds way more value to them being on the team than any pissy assets they get back as trying to you get together a group of assets that make enough sense to all expire at the end of the season is probably a tough decision so in 12 team leagues I'm definitely happy to uh to move on from uh from Brookie at this point which is uh, disappointing given how good he can be and how good he has been over his career but we have to assess it how things are actually going Time for question time. And today's question comes from Daniel Carr, who is on Twitter at Ol Big Bats. Thank you for the question, Ol Big Bats. He says, what is your favorite American food? I'm not sure why the uh, air quotes are there. on, a, Well, not air quotes because it's written. Why the actual uh, quotation marks are on American. But yeah, favorite American food. Um, I started going through this and, and thinking about what my favorite American food is. I would have to say it's barbecue. Uh, as you all know that I did, or not all of you, many of you would have seen that I did purchase a smoker uh, a few weeks back. I set it up over the weekend. I'm going to be using it for the first time this weekend. And my decision has come in of what I'm going to do with that smoker. I'm going to be getting ribs. I'm going to be using them in the Texas style, putting a Texas dry rub on the ribs and uh, and making a Texas style barbecue sauce to go with them. So that's going to be what's happening. I've got to go get my coals and get my wood and all that sort of stuff for the smoker. But barbecue is my favorite American food. But recently I've uh, developed a bit of a hankering for buffalo wings. Now I've been someone who's eaten a lot of chicken in my life, but I've always despised bones. So the invention of boneless wings or the availability of boneless wings here has been fantastic for me. So I love that, but I am getting into eating more wings with bones. I just think it's a, it's an unnecessary obstacle. I want my deliciousness to effort ratio to be extremely high and adding bones into food I think it takes away some of that. It definitely reduces that ratio. So my deliciousness to effort, and that's what part of the reason why I don't like eating crabs that much. Meat is delicious. The effort putting into getting the meat out of the crab, it's it's too high. Your deliciousness to effort ratio, it needs to be sky high. But boneless wings, I'm all about them. Buffalo wings as well. And of course, who can go past a burger? But I would put it at barbecue, buffalo wings, and burgers as the third choice. So thank you for that question, old Big Bats. All right, let's get into these games now and talk about the games uh, across MLK Day, um, which is a, a Monday for you guys there in the States. The first game we look at, the early one, the one that started extraordinarily early here, 4.30 a.m., the Charlotte Hornets and the Detroit Pistons. Dwighty Howard with a real big game, 21-17 and 17 with a steal and four blocks. His overall you know, metrics in terms of ranking looks good for this game because he only went three of six from the line, but we know that we don't care about his free throw percentage at all in fantasy because of uh, you know, the assumption you're making that you're, you're losing that category when you own Dwight, so that was big from him. Marvin Williams on a real tear, 29 minutes, 21 points, five triples and five rebounds, but of course, that's 88% shooting. Over the last two weeks where he is rolling, he's shooting about 60% from the field. Numbers which we understand have absolutely no chance of holding. For now, yeah, he's a guy you can go and have a look in a 12-team league. I would add Marvin over Brook. We talked about Brook Lopez already and just see where it goes. But we can 100% guarantee that it won't continue at this sort of a level and his play will drop off. I know someone posed the question over on Basketball Monster today. Why is Marvin Williams' minutes so much lower than last season? Because he's been shit for most of the year. He is turning it around now, and he's absolutely someone to uh, to hold on to or, or, or to grab and take a speculative ad, but remembering that shooting is going to drop. Nick Batum, a strong game too, 14, 8, and 5 with two steals. The shooting is poor from him. You probably have to be punting field goals. I think he's a must-own guy, while Kemba had 24 and 9. Jez Lamb, two consecutive games under 20 minutes, 11, 2, and 1. I don't think he's a 10-team league guy. I think he's a borderline 12-team league guy, but with Batum healthy and playing big minutes, um, it is really tough to, to consider Lamb a hold, especially with, again, Kid Gilchrist played some decent minutes in this one too. 32 of them didn't uh, shoot particularly well, but the 32 minutes and 33 or 34 for Batum, it does leave Lamb's playing time a little bit up in the air. On to the Pistons, Ish Smith. Really strong from him, 19, 3, and 10, two steals and a block in 35 minutes. He'd been outplayed by Dwight Bikes in the previous game, but it was this one for Smith. He got most of the minutes and most of the production. Bikes had just 6 and 3, and he is just a deeper league guy. Avery Bradley just annihilating your field goal percentage most of the time. 36 minutes, 15, 2, and 1, two steals and two triples, but... 19 shots from the field for 32% and one of two from the line. I still think that you should own him in 12-team leagues, but man, it's been pretty tough. 
Pretty tough night for Andre Drummond as well. 3, 10, and 5. Added three steals, added a block, but the uh, field goal percentage was not ideal, nor was the offensive production. While Reggie Bullock, when he shoots, everything looks great. When he shoots well, 20 points, four triples, 62%, beautiful. The three steals are nice as well, but we've seen that you know the shot can't continue at that level every game, and it's going to cause a drop-off. He's more of a 14-team league guy, but with Stan Johnson battling that hip problem and battling being terrible at offense, yeah, Bullock is going to get a pretty consistent role. I don't expect the tackle box John Lua to come back this season. So if you those of you in deeper leagues, Eric Morland's got a relatively uh, consistent role. That's you know, 20 to 30 team leagues, but I don't think that Lua will return this season. Um, the next game, the Toronto Raptors and the Philadelphia 76ers. Kyle Lowry was back, got into a punch on with Ben Simmons or an altercation and, you know, Simmons was saying, yeah, why don't we uh, meet outside? And apparently they there's, there's reports that they did meet. There's reports that they didn't meet. But uh, everyone, oh, man, don't. Larry, Larry would kill him. Larry would kill him. And this is not anything to do with Australian bias. But for some reason, people just think Ben Simmons is soft. Have you, have you seen how big this guy is compared to Larry? And I understand that Larry is you know, from the tough, mean streets of Philadelphia. But Simmons is a legit monster. And if they, if they fought, I, I, I can't see how Larry would take him down. He's... Simmons is huge. He's big and he's strong. Um, it was an interesting uh, argument that they, they got into after Lowry stood over the ball to prevent it being uh, picked up and inbounded and Simmons just uh, pushed him out of the way to get to that. And that's what started the whole disagreement. Um, but as for Lowry, 13-7-4 and four in 37 minutes. He shot horrifically 3 of 16 while Dillon Wright moved to the bench but put up a big line. 20-4, and four, 5 triples, an assist and a steal on 64% shooting unrealistic production from three and scoring, but I still think he has a role in 12-team leagues regardless of if he starts or not. He plays the one, he plays the two, he plays the three. Freddie Van Vliet, 16 minutes. He had to exit with a um, with a knee contusion. His value, which was which was up there for those couple of games with Lowry out, he's not a guy that can really maintain too much outside of your 16 to 18-team leagues. Jakob Pertl, 7-8 and eight in 27 minutes for him. Two assists and one block. That's a, a really big performance. It's tough to work out what Dwayne Casey's doing with the big man rotation a lot of the time. Jonas Valanciunas, who's been playing well, played 14 minutes, had 8-5 and five there. Uh, Pertl is actually going to be the subject of the player spotlight, which we do later on in the show. So we'll talk about him there. He's more of a, uh, a deeper league guy this this uh, season, but we'll, again, I'll talk about his dynasty prospects and more about him as we move forward. Yeah, 14 minutes for Valanciunas is, is unsustainable in terms of owning him if he plays at that level. I don't think he will, but you know, who knows? He plays 27 minutes, he plays well. He plays 20 minutes, he plays well. There's just no way to understand what Casey is doing with Valanciunas on, on a game-to-game basis, but he's been productive even in 20, 21 minutes. He, he can do that. So he's a, a very tenuous hold, but it's uh, it's tenuous. As I said, tenuous twice. Serge Ibaka, 17 minutes, just um, not ideal. Uh, they're 10 points, 5 rebounds in 17 minutes. Just a, a weird rotational game as uh, Pascal Siakam had 11-6 and six in his 29 minutes, while the Jedi played 19 minutes. Oji Ananobi went scoreless. And we had uh, CJ Miles hit two threes in 21 minutes. He is just a, uh, a three-point specialist. DeMar had 24 with five assists. On to the sixes. Simmons had 12, one and four. He had two steals and two blocks. Uh, an, an okay sort of game. While Embiid had 34 and 11 with a block. Big numbers there. But uh, it was Timothy John McConnell who played 32 minutes. Simmons was in foul trouble, so that limited his playing time, by the way. Uh, McConnell, 18, 6, and 8, three steals and a block. We've seen multiple big games from McConnell. That was a career high in scoring, but the playing time is just not consistently high enough, and he is a hard guy to own in uh, in 12-team leagues. He's an interesting stream option, but he's more of a 14, probably 16-team league guy. JJ Redick left the game late with a leg issue. He had 15 and 5 in 28 minutes. We haven't got an update on that at the moment. Well, Bob Cub had 11 and 8. And Sharich had 11-7 and seven with a triple one. Some okay numbers there, but obviously nothing too exciting. Uh, Rishon Holmes was out again. Um, the next game we take a look at, the Milwaukee Bucks and the Washington Wizards. Eric Bledsoe bounced back after a poor performance in his last game. 23-4-3 with four steals. Big numbers there. Yanni, 27-20 and 20 with six assists and two blocks. Just some horrible percentages, though, which... If he didn't have those uh, really poor shooting numbers from the field and from the line, he would have challenged for the monster. While Chrissy Middleton had 19, 6, and 4, and Brogo, 37 minutes, 16, 3, and 4 with two threes. Now, it's Jason Kidd, so nothing can ever be locked into stone, but it feels like that Brogdon 
is going to hold on to this starting job and he's going to play big minutes. It's amazing it took this long, but this is where we are. Tone Snell, just 15 minutes for six points, while Sterling Brown pushing himself ahead of the sexy boy, Sean Kilpatrick, and Jason Terry, exactly where he should be. I was discussing this with Kyle today. I I think Sterling Brown's better than Tone Snell already. I I know he's better for fantasy. I think he's better as a real-life player. Snell is just, he's just non-existent, and I really like what Brown's doing. So Bucks fans should be pretty excited about what Sterling's putting out there. Onto the Wizards, a big night from Kelly Oubre, 35 minutes, 19 and 5 with three triples and a block. He's just too inconsistent to even consider as a 12-team league guy. I think maybe next season we see him inserted as a full-time starter or at least a part-time starter, and that could boost his value up. But he's not an overall you know, sensational fantasy type profile guy. Brattles Beal had 19, 3 and 3, while Johnny Wall shooting just that's horrible 32 percent but at least he hit his free throws and went 27 4 and 9 with three steals and two blocks mark heath just the 24 minutes and gortat played 26 and both of those guys were putrid and they are far from must own guys um the next game the new york knicks and the brooklyn nets no tim hardaway as it was a back-to-back so mick beasley played 29 minutes had 23 and 10 two assists and two blocks and if you own him maybe there's someone in your league who buys this and thinks oh look bees is back it was just a one game blip sell him trade him because the two games with hardaway there which is something i've spoken about many times the usage in the minutes when he plays with hardaway they just disappear completely so this is a great opportunity to at least try it otherwise you probably just move on and drop porzingis played only the 27 minutes but had 26 and 9 with two threes porzingis uh, and, and two blocks is there. So nice numbers from him. Well, Ennis Cantor, only nine minutes, five and four with a block in that time. After we talked about his minutes trending all the way up, they uh, just inexplicably dropped all the way off. Still is a guy to hold. Kylo Quinn, the cock monster, 23 minutes for him, 11, seven and three with two blocks. We know that if he gets a consistent 23 to 24 a night, he can have 12 team league value. It's being able to uh, you know get he get him that much... Um, Playing time that's uh, that's I guess somewhat of the challenge, so that can be uh, that can be a little bit uh, a little bit tough to uh, to e- expect that from him. Rugged Ronnie Baker with a out of nowhere twenty six minutes. Dougie McDirt played twenty nine, while um, Jarrett Jack started and played thirteen minutes. Again, he played consistently thirty three minutes. Did have some foul trouble, but that's a weird one. And Trey Burke in his Knicks debut played eight minutes for five points and two assists. If people, if people, there are some people who do think that Trey Burke's going to come in and start playing thirty a night or twenty eight a night and being a, a fantasy relevant guy. Trey Burke's not good. He's not going to be a good NBA player. I think I think he's a good dude. I think he's a, a good bloke, but. I just don't see it as the... And I don't know why he even played in this game, to be honest. Just, let's just get Frank going. And, and they did. But if there's a game where Trey Burke comes in and plays 28 minutes and Frank goes down to minutes in the teens, then Hornacek needs to be fired before he even leaves the court. On to the Nets. Levert, a ton of shots for Karras. 20 shots, hit 20 points in 30 minutes. Seven rebounds with three triples. Wasn't the most efficient night from him, but... Uh, Good to see him still getting that playing time. Well, Dinwiddie, 28 minutes, 8, 4, and 5 on 2 of 14 shooting. That's poor. That doesn't portend well for the return of D'Angelo Russell, which is coming really soon. He's going to practice with the Nets, so expect him back for their next game or perhaps the one after. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with Dinwiddie. They're saying all the right things. We want to see them play together, but I just don't know how it's going to work out. I'm not certain. Like, I still hold Spencer, but don't be shocked if he goes down to playing 22 minutes a night and Levert continues his 27 to 28 and Russell gets his 27 to 29 uh, once he fu- uh, fully ramps back up. The Blue Swimmer had six points in 35 minutes. Just a really tough guy to own in standard leagues, while Jarrett Allen had two and four. And Julio Okafor, seven minutes, one block. That is it. He is not going to be a fantasy impact guy this season. He's owned in 31% of leagues. Damari Carroll is owned in 40, and Levert is in 47. Those numbers just don't seem right at all. As for Carroll, 22-8, and eight, two triples with three assists. He's had been really strong since coming back from that knee problem. I think he's a, a guy that deserves a spot on a 12-team league roster in a majority of cases. The uh, San Antonio Spurs and the Atlanta Hawks, big win here for the Hawks. I'm sure it doesn't do their tanking if it's any good. But it was good for them to for Budenholzer to get a victory against Pop. No Kawhi, he was out on that uh, return from injury management with the two-game rest protocol. We don't know when that will end, hopefully soon. But with him out, unsurprisingly, un, uh, Aldridge went off. 25-11 and 11 for LaMarcus, 35 minutes, a triple one. 
This is the opportunity. Again, just try and trade him away and get some sort of top 25-ish value back. I just don't see it continuing when Kawhi plays. Kyle Anderson had a good night, 13-6 and six with three steals in 32 minutes. I don't believe he's a 12-team league guy. Well, Danny Green can be. It just depends on your team. He played 28 minutes. He had 11, 2, and 3, but it's the three steal, the three threes, the two steals, the one block that he can provide, that average of a triple one that Dan Green can give you is uh, is is obviously really valuable for certain team builds. Powell had a, a bit of a stinker, 6-5 and 4 in his 21 minutes, or Davis Bertans. He uh, chucked in the two triples in 24 minutes, and he can be a, a useful streamer in uh, in um, standard leagues if you need threes, but more of a deeper league guy, and he'll see his playing time dip when Kawhi is back. Manu did hurt his uh, thigh in this one, had a thigh contusion. He lasted just five minutes. That'll give ex- extra minutes to guys like DeJounte Murray, and Bryn Forbes. On to the Hawks. Schroeder with another strong game. I think we, we underestimate just how well he's played this year. 26-5-6, and six, while Bazemore only had 10 points, but filled up the other categories. Three, three rebounds, four assists, four steals, two blocks. Big numbers there for Bays. He's a must-own guy. The Undertaker, 12-10 and 10 in 26 minutes. Came off the bench still. I don't know when this Plumley starting bullshit is going to end, but it's got to be soon. Undertaker needs to be owned in all 12-team leagues and probably 10-teamers. While the Baptist John Collins is a positive sign. 22 minutes, which included really a yeah, foul trouble. He picked up his fifth foul at the start of the fourth quarter, and he would have been in line for more minutes. Unsurprisingly, 12-8 and eight in those 22 minutes. Productive stuff. He had a steal. He was 63% from the field. And this is why we say if he plays 24 minutes a night, he's a must-own guy. I am still holding Collins. At some point, they've got to just they've got to understand that there's no absolutely zero point in playing Plumley, and you can say you want to win games, but Collins is your best option to win games. So Budenholzer can't use that excuse, and he can't and yeah, you can't say I'm developing players because Collins ticks both boxes. I want to be competitive, sure. If you want to lose, you play Plumley. But oh, maybe hey, maybe that's what's happening. Who knows? But it was a a, a positive uh, a positive development for the Baptists minutes minutes. Uh, Marco Ballinelli had 10 points in his 21, where Ilyasova had 20 in 28 minutes. Ilyasova's value is going to tumble. There's almost no doubt about that. At some point, it is going to drop off a cliff, but for now, he's a guy that can be owned. Um, I just want to think more on uh, the artist formerly known as Torian Prince. Everyone is really, really getting angry at this guy's performance, and it was a shit, shit effort here, no doubt. 25 minutes, 2 points, 4 rebounds, 3 assists, but it, it causes... Yeah, really wild overreaction. This guy's trash. He's terrible. Because people look at the last two games where he had one point and he had two points. And that's really bad. The two games prior to that, he totaled 36 points and eight triples in those games and played 71 minutes, had six assists in total, two steals, three blocks. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant games. This guy's still a top 100 player this season. He's a top 100 player over the last month. Yeah, it's a little bit of a stretch, uh, a little bit of an issue here in these last couple of games, he's not as hasn't been as aggressive. The shot hasn't been falling, but he's dealing still with a, a dislocated finger, um, which happened five games ago. And there's I don't see any real reason to panic over him. It's two games, but again, you go back two games prior to that, and then you can say, man, he's a top thirty guy. Like I'd look at more the overall numbers and say, look, he's going through a little bit of a slump. His last seven games, he's shooting thirty three percent from the field. That's not good. Twenty nine percent from three, horrible. But those numbers come back up. He plays an extra two to three minutes, and everything starts looking rosy again. If he's dropped in my league, I'll go and add him. Um, the next game, the Miami Heat and the Charlotte, uh, Charlotte, no, the Chicago Bulls. Tyler Johnson, he went down with what looked like a knee injury, and I'd say it looks like a knee injury because he went to the ground and clutched his knee and grabbed his knee and had to be wheeled off the floor. And the Heat come out and say ankle injury. I I cannot understand for the life of me why a bloke goes down. Looks like a knee injury, grabs his knee, and then gets announced as an ankle injury. Absolutely no understanding of that whatsoever. So we'll see what develops. The x-rays were negative on his ankle, probably because I look at the wrong part of the body. And he has no MRI scheduled, which is really good news for Tyler Johnson. So if you did pick him up, you just hold for him at this point and see exactly what happens. If he does have to miss extended time, we're going to see more of Derek Jones Jr., who is a deeper league sort of guy. We're going to see more of Derek Walton Jr., um, I'm not sure if the Heat have any other Derek Juniors on their team, but they might get a, a bump as well. Of course, that last statement is taking the piss, but the Duke Wayne Allington would be the guy that would be a must own. He's probably already a must own anyway. He had 20 points with five triples here. Joshy Richardson, 11, 5, and 6, three threes, two steals, two blocks. I wish he didn't hit that third three, so we could have dropped the Richie Benno on him, but he has been fantastic, and he's going to be fantastic, and he, of course, is a must own guy. While Hassan Whiteside, 
this is the this is what I talked about many many times. Is the minutes aren't going to be there? I'll stop saying it. But twenty minutes, nine and eight, two blocks. You just have to deal with it. That's still decent production, but it's not great. And the minutes aren't going to come back this season, I don't think. Now, whether they go to Bam Adebayo or Kelly Olynyk, that appears to be a coin flip situation. Olynyk played just 17 minutes last game, but played 28 here. He had 21, 3, and 8, while Adebayo played only 19 and had 6 and 5. Bam is not a 12-team league guy. He's barely a 14-team league guy. He probably isn't, to be honest. Well, Olenek is more locked in as a 14-team league guy who can be streamed for 12s. Justice Winslow, 21 minutes for him with Tyler Johnson going down 4, 6, and 4. He would, If Tyler Johnson misses time, he is not a must-own player, in my opinion, Winslow. He just hasn't shown any real ability over long stretches of time to be a fantasy contributor. But if he handles the backup point guard role, which he could, there might be something there. So he'd be a guy to watch rather than a guy to immediately go and add on to the ball, Zach Levine, only 20 minutes, but 18, 5, and 5, two steals, two triples, shooting the ball exceedingly well, 58% in this one, 50% from three, and we know that those numbers are going to dip, and his usage will drop a little bit as well as his minutes re- return, but you know, someone did tweet me today saying he was on their waiver wire, like, you've got to make sure that Zach Levine is owned, he is absolutely a must-own guy. Justin Holiday also crushing at 35 minutes, 25 and 4 with 7 triples, a steal and a block. His field goal attempts and his usage have dropped over the last month or so, but his efficiency has risen in that time. But there's a couple of things here. A, he won't continue to shoot at like 44% from 3, which he's done over the last month. And B, he won't likely get 35 minutes a night because when Levine's minutes go from 20 to 25 to 30 to 32 or whatever they go to, those minutes are coming off Justin Holiday. You're going to have some come off David Nwaba. You're going to have some come off Denzel the Hammer Valentine. But Holiday is not going to stick as a 35-minute-a-night player. And I think he's a really decent chance to be traded at some point uh, heading up to the trade deadline, which is in about uh, three and a half weeks' time. So... For now, he's a guy to own, but this production at this level won't uh, won't sustain. Lowry Market in 30 minutes, 17 and 9, three triples, three assists, one steal. Good production from him again. I tweeted out today that I think Lowry Markin is the number one player in the NBA who needs a haircut. Uh, and of course, everybody replied to that with Lord Alfred Payton. I love Payton's hair. I think it's the top five in the NBA. I also don't buy that it's really impacting his shot. The guy, sh- he's shooting 39% from three. Is he's, uh, he's in the 44th percentile, which is not great for point guards and in uh, mid-range shots, but he's also not the worst. So that means there's 44% of point guards who are worse at shooting jumpers than him, and maybe he can get better. And I understand that, but I, uh, from what I what I get about Peyton's hair, it's something to do with his grandma. That's the reason he, he grows it this way. And I love it. I love how it looks, not even from a basketball point of view. I just love how it looks, and nearly everybody disagrees with me, but I'm all for it. As for Markinen's hair, what's wrong with it, people have said? It's just like this weird curly puff knob. I don't know what's going on. It's just he just needs to have get someone to style it. Just needs just needs a style. And I don't care what the style is. You can go Jarrett Allen and grow out your your afro. You can run with whatever you want to describe Deontay Davis's hair is. That's fine. But when you just you just like I'm just letting it grow into whatever weird style with the you know, big fluffy earmuffs around my ears of blonde curliness. Like you probably need to do something about that, Larry. Just pick a pick a hairstyle and go with it. But that doesn't distract from his fantasy value. Well, Nick Miritich, scoreless through three quarters, 18 points in the fourth, 24 minutes, 18 and five with three triples. I love watching the pairing of him and Markkinen, but uh, it, it appears like he is going to be traded at some point in the coming weeks. Oh, he is a must own to me. I think the majority of places where he goes, because he does have veto power, uh, he will be in a favorable situation. The Hammer had 12 and seven in his 28 minutes, really more of a deeper league sort of a guy. While Punch Bob, Ship Bloke, 18 minutes for Portis, eight points. Yes, if Miritich does get traded, he could move into a 23-minute role. But a power forward could also be brought back. Derek Favors, perhaps, could move back into that role. And I just don't think that Portis is that good of a fantasy guy that we have to just stash and hold him um, in standard leagues. It could happen, but he's just he's not that high of an upside guy, in my opinion. Chrissy Dunn, the shot was not there. Six points on 11 shots, but 10 assists and a steal for him is a, is a nice level of production. The Lakers and the Memphis Grizzlies. Contavious Caldwell-Pope has been terrible this year. He's been in and out of jail, but this was a huge night from him. 27-7, and seven, six triples, three assists, two steals. These are the sort of numbers he would have you know, quite often with the Pistons, but then he was just as likely to go back and drop a six-pointer. 
in the next game. With Brandon Ingram and Lonzo Ball out, he had to shoulder a much larger offensive role, and, and it came together. Now, I wouldn't say that Contavious Caldwell Pope is necessarily a must-own guy with the way that he's played this season, but if you're in a 12-team league or anything deeper, he needs to not be on the waiver wire. He is still... Despite you know, some of his struggles, he's still the 78th ranked player this season. He's getting 1.7 steals a game. He's hitting over two threes per game. He's got you five rebounds and 14 points. Those steals are super valuable. Over the last two weeks, he's a 67th ranked player. You know, I, I think he should be owned in the majority of, of 12 team leagues. Maybe not 10s, but it, it is hard to argue with that production uh, with the way with the way that he's, uh, he's going at the moment. There's going to be some bad games. It's just what he does. He intersperses good games with bad games. But he shot, he scored in double digits for five consecutive games. He's hit double digit threes in all of those games. He's had at least two steals in four of those five games. So he's putting up really, really nice numbers at the moment, KCP. So have a look if he's on your wire and don't feel too scared to grab him. The future MVP, Kyle Kuzma, with a really nice line, 18, 7, and 5, four triples and two steals. He had that little dip but the production's starting to come back up here. Well, Josh, the Hitman Hart. Ah, uh, yes, the Hitman. With Lonzo Ball and Brandon Ingram out, he started, played 32 minutes, and had 16-3-1. and one. Two threes, a steal, and a block. I do really like him, but when those guys play, the minutes are just so limited for him that you've got to push him back to 16 to 18 team league status. As for Julius Randle, 9 and 8 in 22 minutes, he was the victim of Larry Nance's big game. Gaz Payton, the mitten, he uh, just recently signed that two-way, played 12 minutes here, four points with four assists and two blocks. He was a bloke who, when he came into the NBA, his rookie conversion numbers looked really, really good because of his high block rate, good steals, decent assists. Never has been able to stick really in a role unless it was Jason Kidd starting him inexplicably because of his poor shooting. But when Lonzo Ball comes back, Peyton's unlikely to play. But Lonzo's not likely to play in the Lakers next game. So you might be able to, in a 20-team league, stream Gaza in for that one and see how it goes. Tyler Ennis started 6-2-3, and three, while Alex Caruso also played 13 minutes. So those point guard minutes spread around. And Jordan Clarkson, bad. 17 minutes, 9-2-4. and four. He was 2 of 13 from the field. He just isn't that good, and he does not deserve a spot in a 12-team league. The Grizzlies, Tyreek, 15, 9, and 12 in 36 minutes, continues to kill it. But Deontay Davis, this is a bloke who is very, very interesting to me long-term. He's got all of the physical talents to be uh, an impact 24, 25 minute a night sort of a guy. 14 minutes here, 10 and 5 with 5 blocks. He has got a beautiful fantasy game. High field goal percentage, high blocks, pretty good free throw shooter. Good rebounder, can score a bit, but his brain, we ha his mental uh, focus on the game is what really limits him. If he can turn that around, at the, and at the moment, he's supplanted Brandon Wright in the rotation, so he's moved into the backup center position behind Marcus Sol. Yeah, moving forward in two years' time, could he be a 25-minute-a-night starting center? And if he is, that's sort of top 80 fantasy material, but he's got such a low percentage chance of that happening just because of the concentration issues and the mental acuity issues that do uh, that do or have plagued him throughout his cup, first couple of seasons in the NBA, that it, it's a it's a bit of a bit of a gamble, a bit of a bet. But this sort of shows what he can do. He can block shots out of nowhere. He can come in with big scoring, high efficiency nights, and he did it here. So he is a, an interesting name to watch. But it's the off court stuff. It's the the mental concentration things that do really limit him. Marcus Gasol had 17, 7, and 4, so that was nice from him. Jermichael Green, 11, and 9, that's better suited to deeper leagues, while Andy Harrison had 8, 3, and 3 in his 27. While well, Dylan Brooks, shout out to him, that's a big scoring night, career high, 19 points with 4 triples on, of course, 6 of 8 shooting, so you know, stupidly high efficiency, which won't be able to continue. After his first game of the season, he has provided pretty much nothing outside of very deep leagues, and I don't imagine too much changing with him. The Golden State Warriors and the Cleveland Cavaliers, much like on Christmas Day, Zaza Pachulia was a DNP CD and Jordy Bell started. But unlike Christmas, where Bell played 26 minutes, he played only 14 here, 6-3 and three in that playing time. It's it's almost impossible to own Bell in 12-team leagues and probably in 14-team leagues with the way the rotation is up in the air with David West, with Kevon Looney now back in the mix. We know that uh, Bell has leapfrogged JaVale McGee because he didn't even play in this game. But with West, with Looney, with Pachulia, with Draymond playing at center, it, there's just not enough minutes for Bell 
well to be a 12-team league guy. I still love him dynasty-wise. I still think he's got top 50 upside, even in like a 27-minute role or 26-minute role. But getting that role, it might take a couple of years. Draymond had 11, 16, and 9 with two blocks. Good. Steph, 23, 4, and 8 with two steals and four triples. Also good. Iguodala continues to struggle, and he is really hardly a fantasy asset at all. On to the Cavs, Isaiah Thomas. Ty Lue said before the game we're going to up his minutes limit. He played 32. So we're at um, we're at the stage where Isaiah Thomas, where it's like, okay, I thought that maybe you know, he would get to 30 by the All-Star break. No, nah, man, forget it. We're way ahead of that now. 19 points with four assists, horrible efficiency numbers, 8 of uh, 21. That will improve as the season goes on, but we've seen his usage start to dial back a bit. Still took the most shots on the team, which is not something that I really think is a great way for this team to go about it, but it appears that it's going to be the case. Um, yeah, Thomas is uh, is really ramping it up, and he could have a, a top 30 finish from here on out. He's not going to be a top 15 guy like last year, I don't think. LeBron James. 32, 8, and 6, 3 steals and 4 blocks for James. Horrible from the line, but he's been really good this year, but everything else was strong. While Kevin Love, only 27 minutes, and we know he does struggle against the Warriors, and he did get into foul trouble, but a consistent pattern with Isaiah Thomas around Love's minutes and shot attempts get cut. Only a 16.7% usage rate, which is a significant concern. So had 17 and 7 with 3 triples and 2 steals and a block, so good numbers, but it's a huge pain in the ass, obviously. 21 minutes for Jay Crowder. The plumber played 32 and had eight points. Neither of those guys are even sniffing 12-team league value, while Tristan Thompson only 15 minutes, but it's a pretty shit matchup for him, although most matchups this season, to be fair, have been shit matchups for Tristan Thompson. The Sacramento Kings and the OKC Thunder. Now, I could probably sit here and talk for 25 minutes about the Kings, but I could also just sum it up in about two seconds. I have no idea. Dave Yeager came out today and said after the game that from now on, we are going to be going into a resting protocol with our veterans. They will, We will rest at least two veterans, sometimes three, in every game. We will plan this out and we will tell the players at the start of the week which games they will and won't be playing. But of course, we have absolutely zero idea which veterans they're going to be, which games they're going to miss. Is there going to be two guys out? Is there going to be three guys out? The veterans on this team are Zach Randolph, George Hill, Costa Kufos, Garrett Temple, and Vince Carter. So they're the five guys who are going to be subject to resting at least two of them per game. Does that mean that Carter play doesn't play pretty much every game? He's barely played. Does Randolph, um, Zach Randolph and Carter were both DNP CDs in this one. Does Vince and Georgie Hill, do they alternate DNPs? Even in this game that Hill played, he moved to the bench and played 24 minutes. Is that going to be his role from now on? When Zebo plays, will he start or he played 20 off the bench? We still have so many unanswered questions. So when we're looking at you know, Garrett Temple started, he played 18 minutes. When we're looking at stuff on Basketball Monster, smart tool stuff, weekly projections, daily projections, um, trade analysis, we have no idea how any of this stuff is going to go. I literally have to try and guess, well, which two veterans are going to sit out this game. Unless a pattern establishes, which it could, and that could very easily be broken, we are literally guessing if there's going to be two players out each game, at least, maybe three, and they're going to be out of those five guys. But what this does do is it pushes the the floor for guys like Skel de Bissier higher. It pushes Bogdan's floor higher. Now, I've already been telling you that Corley Stein, Bogdanovich, and De'Aaron Fox are the guys to own, and they it's even more so now. Willie played 40 minutes and had 15 and 7 with three steals. He's a must-own. Bogdan started in place of George Hill, played 30 minutes and had 13, 5, and 2 with two steals and three triples. He is a must-own. De'Aaron Fox, 27 minutes, so the minute's going down. So, again, can't work that out completely. Uh, 12, 3, and 5 for Foxy there. Um... Yeah, he's a must-own guy. But what do you do with Lebissier, who played 28 minutes in this one and had 7-7? Seven and seven. It's a bad performance from Skull, but the 28 minutes is super encouraging. I'd be all about adding him in 12-team leagues. Do you go and add Budrick Heald, who played 28 minutes here and had 16-5-4? and four? Probably as well. So now, for a stage where there was a time where you go, there's no one who's a must-own on this team. I, I, there's three definites, and there's probably five guys that you want to own on 12-team leagues. Justin Jackson comes into the mix in deeper leagues. He played 24 minutes here, only three points, but had four steals and two assists. And you'd have to assume he is an every-night part of the rotation. 
does Papianis come in? Now, he played one minute here, but on the nights where Kufos is out, do they just replace Kufos with another interchangeable Greek big man and get him out there playing 7 to 10 minutes a night or maybe 15 minutes a night and putting up numbers? Because when he did it last season, he actually put up some okay performances. But again, it's part of the big unknown with how this rotation is going to go. As for Randolph, get rid of him in 12s. George Hill, get rid of him in 12s. Garrett Temple, don't know why you owned him in any 12s or 14s or 16 team leagues. He can go. Kufos, again, these are all going to be streaming options. If they're, if they're going to play you know, 50 to 60% of the games moving forward, it's really, really tough to hold on to those guys, especially when they weren't performing at a high level anyway. There's just so much unknown with this. This is the same shit they pulled last year after the All-Star break. Absolutely no idea why they would even sign these guys and and play them for half a season. It's just a weird way of going about things um, for the Kings, and it's just so much uncertainty with anyone's role at any point. Now, it's going to be very interesting to see whether they just lock in for a starting role for these guys and just go with it. But again, Temple's one of these veterans who are going to get rested, and they started him today. So that we're going to continually have this changing starting lineup. Dave, De'Aaron Fox, Bogdan Bogdanovich, Budrick Heald, Scalabissier, Willie Cauley Stein, that's your starting five. Started every game. Bring Zebo, Kufos, Temple, Hill, Carter. Rotate them in with the bench guys. Mix them up with Frank Mason the third and with Justin Jackson, with Malachi Richardson, with Georgios Papianis. Mix them through. Give these starting guys a consistent role. I have absolutely zero faith in being able to trust that. But let's let's hope. At least we we understand that the floor on those young guys has been risen significantly by this decision. For the Thunder, Paul George, 18-4-4 and with five steals and a block. That was nice. Russell Westbrook had the triple-double, 19 points, 16 rebounds, 10 turnovers. Just missed the quad-double by only getting nine assists. He got ejected as well. And the free throws, they're just a consistent issue with him. It is really, really weird to see someone plummet so far. We've seen Andrew Wiggins do the same. Jalen Brown, he didn't really plummet because he was bad last year. But this Westbrook thing is a real issue for his fantasy value, and I don't expect it to change. Mallow had 20 points in 32 minutes. Uh, Steve-O Adams, just a horrendous night from the line, 3 of 12. He had 13 and 13, but that's just horrible from the free throw line. While Terry Ferguson started and had 2 points in 18 minutes, and again, he, he played well in that game against the Lakers from a fantasy point of view. And he's done some okay things on court-wise, but he's just not going to be a contributor in most games. But moving forward, he is a guy that does have significant intrigue uh, from a dynasty point of view. The Indiana Pacers and the Utah Jazz. Pacers with a big victory. Oladipo, huge again. 28-6-6 with five triples. And Thaddeus Young in 36 minutes had 17-4-2. We now, at this point, Miles Turner has been ruled out for at least the next three games, and they're considering him week to week. So that is not good for him. He's still a guy to hold, but DeMontis Sabonis is a clear must-own player. 30 minutes for Domas, 15, 8, and 4. He's not going to be able to provide you know consistent top 40 or top 50 value, but he should be easily a top 100 guy over that stretch. Corey Joseph played more minutes than Dazza Collison. 15, 2, and 3 for Joseph, or Collison, 6, 3, and 6 with two steals. I think uh, Collison's the better player, and I still think he is a 12-team league guy over Joseph, but it, uh, it remains something we do need to pay some attention to. Well, Lance Stevenson, under 20 minutes for the second consecutive game. 20 minutes, 4 points, 2 rebounds, and 2 assists. Onto the Jazz, the Don had 23 points in his 33 minutes, 2 steals and 2 triples there as well, while Derek Favors had 16 and 7 with 3 steals and 2 blocks, but his value is going to plummet. Once Gobert returns with Tabo Cephalosha out for the season, Jonas Repko started. He had 8-5 and five in 22 minutes, but that's more of an 18-20 to 20 team league sort of a spot, while Rocket Rodney Hood struggled significantly early on, but ended up with 15 points and not much else. I'm not sure that he's a must-own guy in 10-team leagues. I think he's probably a 12-team league player. Um, but his main contribution is in points. A shit night from Rick Rubio, 23 minutes, 2 and 5. He was limping around the locker room, so there might be something to watch there, while Jingle and Joe was horrendous. Zero points in 20 minutes, took one shot, missed it, one assist and one steal. I think in most cases, he's still a 12-team hold, but the numbers have been trending in absolutely the wrong direction for Jingle and Joe, with Royce O'Neal really starting to come for both his minutes and for Alec Burks. So that is a situation to watch as we move forward. All right, as I said, the Rockets game and Clippers is still going on. If anything major happens in that, I will tweet it out. I'm going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to uh, we're going to talk about uh, the action for Tuesday, where there are five games on. 
sorry, four games on, and then I'm going to shine that player spotlight on Jakob Pertl of the Toronto Raptors. Before we get into that, I'm going to play you a song by Big School. I think they're a Canadian band, and the song is called Doubts. So here is Big School, and then we'll be back to talk some DFS. We are back, of course. The games haven't continued, so I won't be doing the perfect DFS lineup at this point with that last game still in play. But it's now time for the player spotlight, and we're going to shine it on Jakob Pertl of the Toronto Raptors. Pertl, a second-year big man who was a top-10 draft pick last season, has ascended into a much larger role this year. He played only 12 minutes per game last year, averaging 3-3. Three and three, But this year, he's at 18 minutes, averaging 7-5 and five with over a block per game. And he's taken his efficiency up, which is something we expect from young players heading into their second and third season. He's taken his true shooting up from 59 to 65 this season. And he's a guy that has you know, shown us glimpses of some of some pretty big games so far this season. He's had himself uh, two, uh, three double doubles, a couple early season ones against the uh, Spurs and the Warriors, a 10 and 12 and a 12 and 14 game there. He had a 12 and 12 game against the Cavs a couple of games ago with three blocks. So he does excel in the bigger matchups. And Casey has shown absolute confidence in going to him in those big matchups. So that's something to pay attention to. I think that Pirtle will be the starting center for the Raptors next season. And he is a guy that the advanced stats really do like. We'll get into that in... Actually, let's get into it right now. Not many young players are able to post positive box score plus minus numbers. If you're able to post really high box score plus minus numbers in your third or fourth year, it's generally a pretty good indicator that you're going to become a good player. But this season, Pirtle's box score plus minus in his second year, mind you, is 2.8, which is a very, very, very strong number. He's got a massive win shares per 48, which is you know, in large part to do with his team's success, but he's contributing to that team's success. He's got a, 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 a VORP of almost one, which is a huge, huge number for a guy uh, of, of his level, a PR of 18. We're seeing big, big improvements from him defensively, offensively. He looks like a different player compared to what we saw at the start of last season, which I guess is pretty much common place for, for a rookie. The problem we have with him this season, especially, is the way that occasionally he gets uh, dropped down. And we saw three games ago, he had a run of three games under 10 minutes where Bebe Noguera was getting those backup minutes. Now, Bebe is another guy whose advanced stats are, are really positive, and he can be a game changer as well. So the center situation in Toronto is, is an issue, but Bebe is heading into his restricted free agency season. We know that Valanchunas is consistently on the trade block and has looked like yeah, the minutes are consistently getting cut from him. So Pirtle's a guy that I really do like to look at as we move into next season. But the one thing we've got to talk about is his free throw shooting. 
54% last year. He's at 53% this year. Now, over the last two weeks, he's taken it up to 64. He's at 58 over the last month, which is a positive. And he's not a full uh, punt guy because he doesn't get to the line too many times. But you take him at 18 minutes per game, getting there one and a half times. You get him at 26 minutes a game. Maybe he gets there three times, and then we're in a different situation. So maybe he's a punt free throw sort of guy. But he can be a player that can average 14 to 15 points in his prime, that can be a 10 or 11 rebound guy, a 1.8 to 2 blocks per game, one steal. But he's got to work on a few other things to really become an elite fantasy guy. The passing... And, and if he can get you know, two to three assists, that would help. I don't think that's there for him yet. He's got a long way to go in that respect. But his ability to finish efficient, and we're seeing that with guys like Clint Capella. You can block shots. You can finish efficiently and grab rebounds. You can be a top 30, top 40 type fantasy guy. It does limit your overall upside. But Pirtle can be that guy as a high efficiency finisher who can grab rebounds and block shots. I don't think he probably ever gets to the level of Capella just because his shot blocking is not at that same level. It's impressive, but it's not at that same level. He blocks 2.3 shots per 36. He'd need to be like a 2.8, 2.9, I think, guy to really be a, a challenger for that top 30 zone. But I think he's going to have multiple um, top 100 seasons, probably top 70 guys, and I think he'll be a standard league draftable player next season. We see lots of players take notable step forwards, uh, steps forward in their third season, which will, that'll be for Pirtle next season. He's already pushing forward now. We're seeing the trust in the big games. And I think once this center situation works itself out, if Valanciunas gets dumped somewhere, if he gets uh, moved on, or they just make the decision in the offseason that Pirtle is now the guy here, I think that's going to be the case next year. And again, these advanced stats portend really well for his um, career numbers and for him to develop into maybe not an all-star level player, but a guy who's a strong, starting, solid center for eight to nine years in the NBA and producing four to five top 100, top 80 fantasy seasons with those block numbers, with the rebound numbers, and with that really elite efficiency. And if you can correct the free throws and get him to 72 or 73, which I don't think is a crazy, crazy expectation, I think he can do it. It's not completely broken his free throw, so he can get there at some point. That also turns his value up another couple of notches. So Pirtle is a guy who's been very, very impressive this season. The Raptors are a positive with him on the court, only by 0.3, but it's still a positive, which for a second-year player is a huge win. And again, tied with all those other advanced numbers, watching him on the court, watching him beast on the offensive boards, watching him take it up to the best teams in the NBA, it gives me great confidence with him moving forward. And if you can, like if he goes through a, a stretch of playing 12 minutes a night this season, yeah, trying to acquire him for next season for Dynasty Leagues with the expectation that he will be a top 150 guy next year, that would be the way that I'd be doing it. So I'd be approaching his owner. I'd be having a look and saying, you know, what can I give up here? And and trying to make that move to get Pirtle with that expectation of maybe a limited ceiling but the floor is going to come up pretty high and he's going to be a fairly impactful player as he moves forward in his career. So I, I do I do like Yucca Pertl, what he's shown this season, a huge, huge step forward and doing it in the big moments is key as well. Let's talk some DFS action now for uh, Tuesday's games. The first one of those is the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Orlando Magic. This two-game stretch is one of those rarities in the NBA where we get all teams playing across two days. 11 games on MLK Day and four games on um, on Tuesday with no back-to-back. So all 30 teams in action across these two days. The Timberwolves and the Magic. The Magic are just absolutely putrid. And there was a, something I retweeted today by uh, an Orlando Magic blog called, Lan- I think the Twitter handle is Lando, talking about Jonathan Isaac, who apparently is a, is a pastor and he was doing a, a sermon at a church. I'm not sure what the correct term is. Um, and he was going to, do, I think he was doing his first sermon and getting up there and speaking, and he invited all his teammates to come. He said he was super nervous. He's a real awkward guy with anxiety issues, and he, you know, he was umming and ahhing whether he invites his teammates to come and watch him, and he said he eventually invited them all, and no one came, which I find staggering. And look, this is, this is a team that's in a massive tailspin. There's been issues with management decisions and coaching stuff over many, many seasons. But that is an absolutely staggering thing that not one person out of a 17-man roster for when the, the rookie's asking you, hey, I'm doing something, you know, do you want to come and support me and watch? And not one person did it. If this was a close-knit team, there would be multiple... Now, not everyone would come. There wouldn't be all all 16 other blokes appearing there to, to watch him do that. And many of them may not have any sort of religious part of their life. And that's totally understandable. But... If to create camaraderie in your team, uh, surely, 
surely that you would surely someone who is a, a leader and maybe that's part of the problem is that they don't necessarily have these guys that, that step up as leaders as Gordon's still a young guy even Fournier is I guess maybe it sh- maybe it should be falling on him but you know you've got Simmons and, and Peyton you know, D- I would expect a guy like DJ Augustine or, or Aaron Aflalo look if Aaron Aflalo and Mo Spates aren't there for leadership what the hell are they there for they should be going come on guys Let's all go and let's watch. Uh, let's watch John do this, or let's grab a group of guys. But it, it's a staggering thing to me that not one person went and supported him. So that, that that's that's not great. So we'll see what this uh, whether all this you know massive massive nosedive in form if there's just completely fracturing a complete fracturing in the locker room. Which uh, I thought it was a very interesting story to read. Now let's talk DFS. Lord Alfred Payton at 7,200, really crushed it in the last game, 45 points there. It's a pretty decent matchup for him here against the Timberwolves. He's done well against them in the past. They have been a bit of a negative for point guards, so I wouldn't be locking him into cash at that price, but I do think on a four-game slate, he's got that 40-point upside, which is great value at 7,200. Jeff Teague. Uh, Tigo is at 6,900. That's a massive boost from where he was before. He had 39 points in just 29 minutes in the last game. He's back at full minutes load pretty much now. Um, but that price makes it a tough one. But we've seen teams go at the Magic in terms of point guards and put up big numbers. So I do like the upside of Teague here. I just think for cash at that price, with the potential that Butler and Towns dominate the shots... That, that could limit his uh, floor, but I do think a 45-point 40 uh, point upside is, uh, is a realistic thing to expect. At shooting guard, Fournier is at 5,400. I don't see the upside and I don't see the floor, so he's a, he's a fade for me. While we go at 6,500. At 5,500, I would love that. At 65, I'm just not feeling it. Now, Wiggins has got a great um, re- record against the Magic, averages 40 the last three times. They've also got a great ease against him. So if there's going to be a time that you, you take the punt on Wigo to come out here and drop a 50, this is probably the one to do it. So I would absolutely consider him a GPP guy, but you can't really get too involved with him with his floor for cash, I don't think. Jim Butler's a good cash guy, 9,400. Let's lock him in for 40. And with that 50-point upside, that's a brilliant cash option there. While Mario Hazonia at 43, Nemanja Bielitsa, and Weza Wundu, are the other small forward options, and I don't really see too much with any of those guys. As Gordon, 7,500 for Azza. Um, the shooting has been off for him, and that's really impacting his production. He, he does have the ability to go off, clearly, but this is not a good matchup for him, so I think that he is a fade. Well, Taj at 5,600, I think he's a decent cash guy with limited tournament upside. Gorgie Jeng at 37, not really a guy I'm really focusing in on. Centers, Townsy, 9,500 in on this one. I like the matchup for him. Bismack Biombo, yeah, look, he can do some stuff defensively, but it's not going to be too much of a concern. I think Towns has got that 40, 44, 45 point floor with 55 point upside, which makes him a cash and a tournament guy. As for Biombo at 6,400, I, I don't like that at all against the Timberwolves, and that is really a, a fade type situation. Let's uh, go across to DraftKings now and have a look where the value is. I think at Townsy at 9,500, I like. Jimmy Butler at 92 is strong. Alfred at 65, I like that. I like that more in cash than I do on DraftKings. And Teague at 6,400 is also a strong play. Much the same stuff that I said about Wiggins and Taj Gibson, uh, that still holds for these guys. John Simmons, a guy I didn't talk about with Fangio. I don't really like uh, using him. He might be a GPP guy, but I don't think that this is a a great spot to use him with uh, Butler or Wiggins guarding him. The next game, the New Orleans Pelicans and the Boston Celtics. The Celtics are favored by four and a half, and the total is 214 points. Jason Tatum and Al Horford are both listed as probable, while Shane Larkin is questionable with an illness, but he's not going to have too much of an impact on our DFS lineups at all. At point guard, Rajon Rondo, 5,500. He's averaging 15 points in 25 minutes over the last three games. If you want to go revenge game, by all means, but this is something I want zero to do with, so that is a strong fade for me, whereas Kyrie Irving at 8,200 historically has torn apart the Pelicans, of course, most of that coming with, or all of that coming with the Cavs, But at 8,200, he's a guy that should be in your tournament pool. And on the limited slate, he could be a cash type of option. Ian Clark at 3,600 is getting some more minutes with Rondo out, but not really turning it into much in terms of production. While Terry Rozier at 4,300, maybe a tournament guy in a blowout, gets some extra minutes, but I don't really feel super strongly about Rozier, especially with the Celtics likely having to go bigger, meaning we're going to see less Marcus Marcus Smart at the three, Jason Tatum at the four type uh, type of lineups. 
The uh, shooting guards, Drew Holiday, 7,500. This guy is just killing it at the moment. I like him quite a bit. Now, the Boston defense is a level of concern, so I'd probably push him more towards tournaments at that price pa- price point, but he has been putting up numbers on a consistent basis when he runs point guard, playing off the ball. He's been fantastic. Smart at 5,500. He averages 38 points in the last three times against the Pelicans, which is just a stupendous amount for Marcus Smart. So if you want to believe that he knows how to play against them and knows how to get shit done against Anthony Davis, then at 5,500, by all means, in a tournament. I'm not so convinced that that's going to be replicable, but it's over the last three games, so there is something happening there. At small four, Jalen Brown's at 5,500. I'm okay with that. I think that's a good cash player. I like that. Well, Eton Moore at 4,800. I think he's got limited upside and a low floor. So to me, that's a, a guy that I steer clear of. At power forward, Tone Davis, $11,000. Just putting up numbers consistently. We know that the uh, Celtics have been a tough matchup for big men so far this season, but I don't really care. I'm, I'm all about using Tone here in cash and in tournaments, whereas Vanilla Tice is a guy who I am interested in, averaging 25 points, Daniel Tice, in the last three games. He's going to have to play more as they go against this big lineup. He's at 3,800. He could be a uh, a GPP decider, I reckon, uh, Tice. So he's a guy to consider there. Marcus Morris at 4,700. Maybe more of a tournament guy, but not someone I'm super interested in. Well, Jace Tatum at 5,600. That price drop. Um, the knee is a bit of an issue. Some of his shooting hasn't been great, but 5,600, I think that's I think that's actually usable for cash. Um, if he was still that 6,200, it would be a definite fade. At center, Al Horford, 7,100. I'm going to go with my don't play big men against Boogie uh, style. So I think we'll uh, we'll fade there while Boog at 11-2 in on that. I think we're looking at a, uh, a 50 to 55 point outburst, which is really you know solid value with 65 point upside. All again, but much like Davis, the big men have struggled a little bit against Boston, but uh, at, at center position, less so than the power forwards. Aaron Baines is another guy you can cons- consider along with Vanilla Tice. He's at 3,800. Uh, throw him into a tournament maybe, but I'd, I'd rather throw that money onto Tice than onto Bainesy at this point. In DraftKings, uh, Drew at 6,700 is a really good play. I love that for Drew. I love Boog at 10.5. I love Tone Davis at 10.2. They are all super strong cash plays. Horford and Irving, much worse than on Fangio. The price for Jalen Brown at 5,900 takes him out of cash consideration. I'm fading Rondo still. And of course, Marcus Smart, the same stuff that I talked about there on Fangio. And Vanilla Tice at 3,800. He's got some of that upside again if they have to run with more of those two big lineups, which you would imagine they do as they try to defend against Anthony Davis and DeMarcus Cousins. The next game, the Dallas Mavericks and the Denver Nuggets. The Nuggets are favored by five and a half, and the total is 211. I would expect a lineup change for the Nuggets. I would expect Mason Plumley to move out of the starting lineup, and I would expect either Torrey Craig to move in or Trey Lyles to move in. I would expect Jokic to therefore have a bigger performance as he plays his better position. Um, but we will see. That is all speculation on my part, but that is the way that I anticipate this going. There is no J.J. Barea for the Mavericks, so... Let's fire up our Dennis Smith Juniors. 6,500 in a very tasty matchup. Let's fire up our Yogi Kevin Ferrells at 5,300 in a very tasty matchup. They're going to start next to each other, and they are both cash options in my in my opinion. I, I like both of them here. Uh, on the Denver side of things, you've got the Blue Arrow, Jamal Murray, 6,700. Point guards against Dennis Smith, they have a history of going off. So Murray is a great GPP guy. He was shitful in the last game, just six points, but this is 45-point upside territory for Murray, but not a cash option, I don't think. At shooting guard, Farton Will Barton, 6,500. He could also take advantage of the Dennis Smith uh, lack of defense. 38-point average against the Mavs his last three times out, like his tournament upside here quite a bit, while Devin Harris at 35. With Breyer out, he's going to absorb some more minutes. I like him. You could even consider him in cash, so you can get a boog, uh, Tone Davis front court combination going. Wes Matthews also should be a strong cash guy at 5,200 with JJ gone. Gaz Harris. Nice, Gary. Gaz is at 6,500. I feel like there is limited upside there, but there is a pretty decent floor, so he is in play for cash. At small forward, baby neck Wilson Chandler. And sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. There's so many players that I can play that for. I'm just going to keep rotating it around. Chandler's in an okay situation here. Could see himself moved up to the four where he can pull down more rebounds, which will help his overall numbers, but more of a tournament guy than a reliable cash guy. While the pencil Harrison Barnes, 6,800, 
a really strong floor, 30-point minimum over his last five. Don't like him for tournaments, but I do like him for cash. At power forward, we've got Dwight Powell at 3,900, an interesting tournament sort of a guy, while Trey Lyles at 58. The numbers have been a little bit dropped for him recently, but I like the matchup. I like the potential of him, or I like the potential of the Nuggets not getting their ass kicked, so his minutes getting limited. So I do like Lyles here at 5,800 here. Dirk at 5,000. I think Dirk at 5,000 is a fine cash option. He's averages 26 over the last three, averages 29 in his last three contests against Denver in only 24 minutes per game. The Nuggets defense is not great against the big men, so I think that Dirk at 5,000 is a strong cash guy. Plumlee's at 4,800 as a center. I have no interest in that at all. Well, Jokic at 9,700. I really want to say he's a cash play, but I'm not ready to do that at this point, given we don't know the lineup issue, but if he is back to center, I think you could consider him a cash play, but he's behind guys like Davis and Cousins in that front court in terms of where you want to spend your money, but this could be a 55-pointer for Nick. Uh, Could go even higher, but I'm not ready to go with him as a cash option just yet. On DraftKings, lots of options here, lots I like. I like Dwighty Powell, Baby Neck. They're both tournament guys, and Farton Will Barton at 56. That, that is super hard to avoid. I like that a lot for cash. The Blue Arrow at 57 is great for cash. Dennis Smith at 63, I'm all about. Jokic at 87, I think you can even go with him at cash there. Gaz Harris at 6,000, Yogi Ferrell at 45, Trey Lyles at 55, and Wes Matthews at 48. This is a good stack game for tournaments, and there's lots of value opening up for cash in this Dallas-Denver game on DraftKings. All right, let's go to the last game of the night. It's the Phoenix Suns. They're taking on the Portland Trail Blazers. This is where the injury questions come into play. Marquis Chris is listed as doubtful, while Josh Jackson and TJ Warren are both questionable. Jackson participated in practice but was limited, while Warren uh, is more likely to miss. And for the Blazers, Shabazz Napier is questionable with lower back issue that limited his minutes in the last game. Of course, if Warren is out and Jackson plays, then Jackson gets the start and becomes a great option. Dragon Bender, who shit the bed in the last game, he's got a chance to bounce back. But if both Warren and Jackson are out, then where does the value go for this team? Like, who ends up getting these minutes on the Suns if both of those guys are out? Well, I think we're going to see a ton from Devin Booker. We're going to have to see more Tyler Eulis and Isaiah Cannon combinations. We're going to see Devon Reed get perhaps close to 20 minutes. And maybe, or Davon Reed, maybe you could consider him. He would be a, the absolute flyer of flyer GPP options. But if both Warren and Jackson are out, the wings on this team are just non-existent. So they are going to have to dig pretty deep. Daniel House has already been ruled out as well. So that's another name you can take out of that uh, group of guys who could perhaps contribute there on the wing. While Troy Daniels would become a very, very strong option. in, I think he'd have to get close to 30 minutes if both Jackson and Warren are out. At point guard, Napier's at 4,100. Um, yeah, look, the concerns over the back, the limited role, it's a little bit hard to use him. Well, Dame Lillard at 9,300, he has torched the Suns. I'm sure all Suns fans will be aware of that. Averages 49 the last three times. I think he is a pretty good cash, but just a better tournament guy. Euless and Cannon, 4,200 and 3,600 respectively. I would consider them tournament guys if Warren and Jackson are both ruled out. At shooting guard, CJ's at 8,200. That is a strong fade for me, especially when I can get Devin Booker at 7,800, who's going to potentially have you know, 45% usage if TJ and Josh Jackson are both out. So he comes into play there. Connaughton. Yeah, minimum salary guy who had a big game in the last one. So maybe if Napier is out, then Patty could be a tournament guy. While Troy Daniels, also minimum salary, and we'd be smashing him if uh, those guys are out, as I mentioned before. Josh Jackson at 5200 That's a $1,000 price rise. I am all about Josh Jackson if he plays at that price. I think there's some cash value there and tournament value, especially if TJ is missing. Evan Turner at 41 TJ Warren at 68 I don't really find much appealing about either of them. At power forward, the chief, Al Farouk Aminu, the king of this. And sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. He's at 5,500. It is a great, great matchup for uh, for the Chief. I think he is a tournament guy, but absolutely no way that I feel comfortable in cash. While Bender at 4,800 had three points in the last game and price rose by $700. The pricing algorithm a little bit off there. More of a tournament guy than cash at 4,800. But he'd been strong up until that last game where he was uh, the opposite of strong. At center, Yusuf Nurkic, $7,000. Really, really dipping. I think he's... Um, ownership is going to be low, but I love the matchup for Nurk here. You probably want to lean more tournament, but on a four-game slate, he might be worth a look in cash. Tyson Chandler at 48, he's the opposite. I wouldn't touch him in a tournament, but for cash, I feel like he's going to get me 25. I feel like that's going to happen, especially if Chris misses, as we expect. 
Alex Len at 39 is a GPP option here, while Zachy Collins at minimum salary. Played big minutes in the last game, didn't do much, and probably not a guy that we want to get too interested in. On DraftKings, I like Lillard a lot at 9,300 and the Chief at 4,700 and all that other stuff remains. I like Devin Booker, uh, Yusuf Nurkic is worth a look and Joshy Jackson at 48 is pretty strong if he uh, actually happens to, uh, to play, which we don't know at this point. Let's look at the other sites now. Let's go to Yahoo. On tournaments, as Gordon, Yusuf Nurkic, Jeff Teague, Mason Plumley, Hazonia, Devin Harris, and Terry Rozier as some tournament options. And then for cash and tournaments, Dwighty Powell, Tyson Chandler, Jalen Brown, Joshy Jackson, Kevin Farrell, Gary Harris, Dennis Smith Jr., CJ McCollum, Dame Lillard, Jim Butler, and Nick Jokic. On Moneyball for tournaments, Jokic, Aaron Gordon, The Blue Arrow, El Farouk Aminu, Joshy Jackson, Dragon Bender, Vanilla Tice, Devin Harris. And for cash, Tyson Chandler, Wes Matthews, Jalen Brown, Trey Lyles, Kevin Farrell, Gaz Harris, Jeff Teague, Alfred Payton, Drew Holiday, Dennis Smith Jr., Dame Lillard, Jim Butler, Carl Anthony Towns, Tone Davis, and Boog Cousins. And on Draft Stars, don't play the 400 target. Uh, tournaments, Carl Anthony Towns, Al Farouk Aminu, Baby Neck Wilson Chandler, Dwight Powell, Vanilla Tice. And for cash and tournaments, Wes Matthews, Trey Lyles, Yogi Ferrell, Gaz Harris, Drew Holiday, Alfred Payton, The Blue Arrow, Dennis Smith, Dame Lillard, Nick Jokic, Tone Davis, and Boog Cousins. If you are listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, go and leave a five-star review. It's the best way that you can support the show. And of course, check out basketballmonster.com and the rest of the Locked On Podcast Network. My name is Josh Lloyd. I am the lead fantasy analyst at Basketball Monster. Go and follow me on Twitter at redrock underscore b-ball. Follow Basque Monster and Locked On NBA Net as well. You can find this podcast on Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, and Spotify, and of course, YouTube. Give me a thumbs up, give it a subscription, set the notification bell on, and leave a comment. We are done here, guys. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Nicola Miritich.